Face here back with another reaction video. This time I'm reacting to Imjin War Japanese Invasion of Korea 1592 to 1598 by Kings and Generals. Now, again, embarrass embarrassingly, I know about this thanks to Age of Empires 2, so another thing that I got got to be kind of embarrassed about because no one really has answered the question how um, historically accurate the, the 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 history in Age of Empires 2 actually is, but that's a weird little side out. And I know, and it also um, brings to light the um, the only major his the only historical figure I know from Korean history is Admiral Yi Sun Shin. And the Japanese invasion was 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 orchestrated by Hideyoshi. I know the I know the Koreans eventually repelled the Japanese with their famous turtle ships. Or I think it's I think the real name they were known as Kabuksan. But again Feel free to correct me if I've got that pronunciation wrong. Well, I don't know why I said that. The video will probably... No, my luck. The video will probably correct me. So, um... Oh, and I should also put, point out that... Because this this video is 1 hour 28 minutes and 20 seconds long... This will be split down into two parts. So, um... So the usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical, any historical content in that matter, if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction, it is probably obvious I don't know much about the subject at hand, and if I do know anything, I'll most likely pause the video to give my input or ask any curious questions, which hopefully will be answered in the comments. So with that being said, the link to the original video will be in the description down below. Please go please go and subscribe to um kings and generals if you want to and check out their other con other other uh content that they cover on their channel cuz cuz they're still one of one of um one of the best history channels on YouTube to watch among among a fair few of them so um i know there's a proper way better way to word that but um, I'm recording this at um, nearly 20 minutes to 2, two o'clock in the morning. So, um, so again, this is a long one that's going to be split down in two parts. I've said what I've had said, so full screen, subtitles on. Let's get this up here. And this, obviously, this will be the first part. Let's get into this. Loud. Japan, at the dawn of the 17th century, was entering a new epoch. The country had just been united, and thus the Sengoku Jidai, a near century and a half of endemic feudal warfare, had come to an end. Peace proved to be yet another challenge for the new overlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi, for his country was now home to hundreds of thousands of warriors with no war left to fight. Thus Hideyoshi turned his ambitions outwards, and now that he could harness some of the most veteran armies in Japanese history, he would launch a devastating invasion of Korea. Welcome to the new Kings and Generals video on the Imjin War. These long videos are very difficult to make, so consider subscribing, liking, sharing and commenting to earn us some grace with the gods of the algorithm. You can support us via Patreon, the link in the description, or via YouTube membership, the button is under the video. Now this may have happened a long time ago and in a far off place for most people, but you should know that Japan might still show up at your door. Fortunately it's quite a different sort of visit, as now they're just delivering tasty snacks and treats, which is the role of our sponsor Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. These are two different snack box subscription services that both bring an experience of Japan into your home. 
Tokyo Treat focuses on seasonal products that are exclusive to Japan. Check that out too, link Feel in the description. Feel free to check that out if you're interested. In the last two decades of the 16th century, Green tea the great Australia. warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi had more or less achieved his goal of uniting Japan's many warring fiefs. In 1582, he claimed Honshu in its entirety after succeeding his betrayed master Oda Nobunaga. Shikoku was then subdued in 1585, and Kyushu fell soon after in 1587. As the land of the rising sun came ever closer to unification, all rival daimyo who swore to follow Hideyoshi were allowed to keep their domains and were promised more lands and spoils. However, once Japan was unified, lands and spoils would be hard to deliver on, as there would be no more battles to fight or gains to be had. Aware of this fact, he made plans to turn his vassals outwards in the late 1580s, hungrily eyeing Korea as the initial target, and... Hang on a second. Sorry about that. ...the Chinese Ming Empire after that. Hmm. These invasion plans were more than an artful solution to keep his belligerent warlike vassals busy. Like Nobunaga before him, Hideyoshi believed that his power ought to extend beyond the confines of his small island nation, and was convinced his destiny was to conquer further afield. Oh, I should have said this at the beginning, but sorry if you can hear my fan in the background because it's quite warm where I am. The great unifier's most recent conquest was the island of Tsushima, located at the midpoint of the Tsushima Strait. The lords of this clan, the So, had since become Hideyoshi's vassals, and were ordered to deliver a message to the Koreans, which demanded their submission to the Japanese state. This put the So in a difficult spot, for their long relations with the Korean Joseon monarchy made them ideal diplomats but an outbreak of hostilities between Korea and Japan would damage the trade which granted the clan much of its wealth. Aiming to soften the diplomatic blow as much as he could, So Yoshishige altered Hideyoshi's message to the Korean court, blunting much of its threats and demands, and changing it so that it stipulated only a simple tribute mission be sent to Japan in order to confirm Korea's respect. However, this plan would backfire. In a lethal blunder, the So clan leader sent a rough, hardened subordinate, known as Yutani Yasuhiro, to deliver the message, instead of going himself. Yasuhiro himself. conducted himself in the most indelicate way possible, wow. insulting his Korean hosts by degrading the size of their spears compared to the Japanese wow. and mocking their lifestyle. Not content with that, the brash envoy warned, your country will not last long. Having already lost the sense of order and discipline, how can you expect to survive? Wow. The uncouth nature of the envoy's conduct and the unacceptable demand led to the Korean refusal to pay any form of submission or respect to Hideyoshi. Naturally, Hideyoshi was furious at the failure and ordered that Yasuhiro and his entire family be killed. So Yoshishige wow. was punished less severely being replaced as daimyo of Tsushima by his adopted son, Yoshitoshi, who Hideyoshi considered more trustworthy. Over the next few years, more embassies were sent from Japan to Korea and vice versa. In a crucial visit to Kyoto in 1590, Korean courtiers failed to gather intelligence on just how powerful Hideyoshi's military was, leading their government to underestimate the imminent danger. Furthermore, the issue divided the Korean court factions, named for the location of their respective headquarters in Seoul. Mm -hmm. Members of the Westerner faction gradually came to realize the very real peril Japan posed, but any attempt to prepare for the invasion was actively opposed by the Easterner group. In Japan, a colossal war machine was gearing up in the summer of 1591, beginning with Hideyoshi's establishment of a newly fortified headquarters complex on the island of Kyushu. From there, he oversaw the levying of a massive army, comprising 335,000 total troops, 158,000 of which would cross to Korea itself. The levies were raised by Japan's various daimyo lords, who, in a system known as gunyaku, were obliged to supply a predetermined number of men according to the size and wealth of their fiefdom. Beyond that, other political factors could influence a daimyo's required contribution, 
such as their personal standing with Hideyoshi. The 158,000 strong invasion force consisted of 82,200 men from Kyushu, which was closest to Korea, 57,000 from Honshu, and 19,600 from Shikoku. Wow. How this giant force was equipped must be discussed <coughs> for a moment to deconstruct the commonly held romantic notions of what the Japanese armies of this age looked like. Rather than a noble force of katana-wielding samurai, the majority of Hideyoshi's invading troops were instead humble Ashigaru, peasant foot soldiers, wow. armed with swords, spears and bows. Perhaps one third of this army was armed with arquebuses, an early form of firearm introduced to Japan by the Portuguese, who had made landfall in Kyushu some decades earlier. Hideyoshi's plan was to be a domino rolling through Asia. When the Koreans were conquered, they were to supply manpower and material for the push into China. When the area around Beijing was conquered, that area would supply manpower for a push further into the Middle Kingdom, and wow. so on. The invading force would be ferried to Korea by 700 assorted ships, which, along with their crews, were requisitioned from the various daimyo of the coastal provinces. These were mostly repurposed merchant or civilian vessels. Though Hideyoshi had a massive army at his disposal, in addition to high-quality military technology on land, naval power would prove a problem for him throughout the coming conflict. In contrast, the Koreans had just two advantages over the Japanese – their superior shipbuilding and cannon technology. These upsides, however, were overshadowed by the fact that corruption in Korea was rampant, leaving military units neglected, untrained and lazy. As a whole, the Joseon Kingdom was not ready for the storm that was coming. However, one man within it, later to become Korea's most venerated war hero, certainly was – the 46-year-old Korea soldier Yi Sun Shin. After being assigned to Chola in late 1590, Yi immediately understood that his province could serve as a possible beachhead for an invasion. Determined to be as prepared as he could, he spent a year diligently studying naval command whipping his men into shape and repairing infrastructure. Meanwhile, after being delayed multiple times, three contingents of the first wave of Japanese invaders were ready to sail by May 22nd. On the 23rd, 18,700 troops under the command of Kanishi Yukinaga and So Yoshitoshi set out for Busan. It was a risky voyage, for the warships earmarked to guard the troop transports had not arrived and so this fleet was completely vulnerable. Though initially believing the ships on the horizon were part of an abnormally large trade mission, the Korean commanders in the Busan region gradually came to realize that the invasion had begun. They could have used the superior warships under their command to assault the undefended Japanese fleet, but in a catastrophic lack of decisiveness and initiative, mm. they failed to do so. By That's nightfall on May 23rd, Around 400 transports crowded the waters off Busan, resting in the harbour completely unopposed. After a final demand for an unopposed Japanese crossing to China was rejected, the troop landings began. At 4am on May 24, 1592, 5,000 men under Yoshitoshi disembarked onto land, followed by another 7,000 under Yukinaga. Eventually, the entire first contingent had disembarked and a Japanese army had landed on Korean soil without a single shot being fired. After two brief sieges, the main fortresses at Busan and its harbour fell, triggering panic among military leaders in surrounding provinces. In yet another stunning act of military ineptitude, the incompetent Korean naval commanders scuttled their sizable provincial fleets and destroyed their weaponry and provisions, retreating north as quickly as they could. With Busan secured, okay. the proud Yukinaga refused to wait for reinforcements as instructed. Instead, he immediately pushed north along the middle of the peninsula on May 26, marching at a blistering pace, likely wishing to monopolize the glory of seizing the capital for himself. This invading force first came to the deserted town of Yangsan, then went on to secure Miryang and Daegu on May 28, pillaging and plundering as they did. Realizing he had to mount some opposition, the governor of Gyeongsang province, Kim Su, tries to lead a force south to meet the Japanese. However, he soon withdrew without fighting after learning that Dongnei had also fallen. 
News of the Japanese invasion had reached Yisun Shin in Chola on May 25th, along with the shocking knowledge that both of the Gyeongsang navies had already self-destructed. However, Yi waited patiently. He had orders to defend his segment of the coastline, and would do so. He remained confident that the Japanese could be defeated on the seas, despite their superiority on land, so Yi was biding his time. Meanwhile, a second Japanese army landed in Busan on May 28th, under the command of Kato Kiyomasa. The troop ships this time disgorged a fearsome contingent of 22,800 soldiers. Realizing that the vanguard under Yukunaga had not waited for him, the irritated Kiyomasa also swiftly pushed forward. He took the eastern route, seizing the cities of Ulsan, Kyongju, Yongchong, Xinyong and Kumo on the path to Seoul. Yeah, this is another thing that that invading armies can suffer with is uh, personal rivalries where commanders cannot put their differences aside which, um, well, differences and egos and that's, that's in danger of failing their mission but there's probably got to be some reason why these two are not fond of each other Kiyomasa blazed with determination, resolved not to let his rival Yukinaga reach the capital before him. On the 28th, a third prong of the invasion opened up, when Hideyoshi's third contingent, under Kurida Nagamasa, arrived at Angolpo. This force consisted of 11,000 troops, who after seizing the nearby fort at Kimhai, would take the western route north. Three Japanese armies were now set to converge on the Korean capital at Seoul, but they would not get to the city totally unopposed. At Chengju, around 100 kilometers south of the capital, the revered Joseon general Sin Rip had assembled a sizable resistance army of 8,000, and he intended to fight. The ragtag agglomeration of cavalry troops, officers who had retreated from the south, and hastily raised levies from the north, possibly could have held the Choyong Pass, which had been General Sin's original plan. However, retreating Korean units revealed that it had already been lost, so instead, Sin chose to do battle at Chengju on an open field. At midday on June 6, 1592, as the Japanese were descending from the Chuyong Heights, General Sin drew up his army outside Chengju on a stretch of flat ground, hemmed in by a hill called Tangumde to their flank and the South Han River behind them. This was a death trap with no possibility of retreat, and this was precisely the point. Placing troops in this kind of situation was a long-established Chinese military tactic, which had led to remarkable victories in the past. Perhaps the Koreans could use it to halt the robbers, as they derisively called the Japanese. As Yukinaga's first contingent descended from the heights, Kiyomasa emerged from the eastern route and managed to catch up with his rival Daimyo near Chengju. The latter was angered that Yukinaga had stolen the glory by storming ahead, and demanded to now take the lead with his own force. He refused, and Kiyomasa decided that he would take revenge on his rival at Chengju. As Yukinaga began his advance towards the city from the southeast, the second contingent stayed behind, hoping their rivals would be defeated. The attacking troops fanned out as they approached the town, finally emerging opposite General Sin's force in a vast arc. At 2pm on the afternoon of June 6th, Yukinaga divided his army into three main units. 10,000 soldiers under himself and his retainer, Matsura Shigenobu, formed the vanguard, while So Yoshitoshi and his 5,000-strong contingent formed the left flank. Finally, 3,700 assorted troops, commanded by their minor daimyos, Arima Harunobu, Amuri Yoshiaki, and Goto Sumiharu, were placed on the right. Arkabusiers were placed on the front lines of the Japanese army, while behind them stood Ashigaru footmen, armed with melee weapons. When arrayed in battle formation, the Japanese advanced with a roar of musket fire. It was hardly even a contest. General Sin's amateur forces were almost immediately overwhelmed by flying arquebus balls and began to suffer devastating losses. The peasant soldiers began to rout under the pressure, but the brave general would not retreat so easily. He led his crack cavalry in a headlong charge towards the enemy line. It was to no avail. The arquebusiers rained withering musket fire down on his horsemen, breaking the charge before any contact was made. 
In short order, General Sin's 8,000-strong army had ceased to exist, many survivors of the initial slaughter being hunted down by pursuing Ashigaru soon after. Sin threw himself into a natural spring adorned in full armor, committing suicide by drowning. Wow. News of Sinrip's defeat at Chengju caused panic in Seoul, and with no army to defend it, the Korean court decided to flee, despite the pleas of the populace. Kanishi's decisive victory angered his rival commander Kato even more. Some sources claim that Kanishi was initially against the war, and in a possible attempt to damage Hideyoshi's position, even warned the Korean court about the invasion, wow. and was now moving quickly to erase any evidence of his betrayal. After almost coming to blows, the two daimyos took separate paths to Seoul. Kanishi's route was easier, looping north and west where the Han River was not a decisive obstacle. At the same time, Kato took a shorter route directly north, but where the river was at its widest. After performing this river crossing with considerable ingenuity, Kato was shocked upon seeing the banners of his rival flying over the city's battlements. He had been beaten again by mere hours. Wow. Kuroda Nagamasa and his third contingent, as well as Yukita Hideie's 10,000, arrived on June 16, 1592. The Korean capital itself was occupied with little bloodshed. Meanwhile, the Korean court had evacuated to Pyongyang. According to some sources, angered by their king's abandonment of them, the angry citizens burned many of the royal residences. Now that the capital had been taken, the Japanese armies set out to consolidate their gains. The countryside was pillaged largely without resistance. However, some Korean forces were still in the field. When the Japanese started raiding the area called Yangju, directly to the north of Seoul, the commander of a minor Korean unit decided to use their complacency against them. Mm. As the Japanese were pillaging Yangju, the Koreans appeared near the village. This drew the attention of the invaders, and a group of them moved against the Koreans, who upon contact dropped their weapons and started running towards the nearby mountains. They were chased by the Japanese, but it was a trap. As soon that as the was. enemy entered the mountain pass, the Koreans hiding here surrounded and destroyed this unit. Although the invaders lost only around 100 troops in this minor battle, it improved the morale of the Korean armies and forced the daimyos to be more careful in their raiding. After leaving Seoul, Kanishi and Kato, bitter rivals to the end, were split up again, their contingents marching to quell the northwestern Pyongan province and the far northeastern province of Hamgyong, respectively. Both were expected to reach the Chinese frontier at the Yalu and Tumen rivers during their expeditions. Furthermore, an 11,000-strong third contingent would seize Huangke province. On top of this, a fourth contingent of 14,000 men would march east to quell the eastern coastal lands of Gangwon, while a fifth division of 25,000 troops would subdue the west coast province of Changchong. 15,700 soldiers of a sixth division set out for the bypass Chola province, while 30,000 men of the seventh would hold the crucial beachhead province of Kyongsang. Finally, Ukita Hideie's 10,000 would hold Seoul itself and the neighboring Kyonggi province. Hideie himself was appointed by Hideyoshi as an interim supreme commander. Japanese consideration now turned to logistics and supply. However, when Kato moved his troops to the north, he found that the Koreans, under Kim myong won had force-marched their way to block the Japanese on the opposite side of the Imjin River. Although the Japanese had 20,000 troops and outnumbered the Koreans almost two to one, the latter were in a great position to defend. The rains had flooded the river, making the crossing even more difficult for Kato. Before the Japanese approached the area, Gim had already burned the nearby forests and moved all of the boats in the area to the north coast. He knew that reinforcements were on the way and was planning on waiting on them in his excellent defensive position. Unfortunately for him, he didn't have full control of his army, for half of it was commanded by the courtier Han Ang In, who demanded an immediate confrontation with the Japanese. The Battle of the Imjin River started on July 6, 1592. On the first day, the armies exchanged arrow and cannon volleys, but as the distance between the two was significant, neither side suffered much. On the second day, the Koreans received 3,000 cavalry reinforcements. For Kato, it was clear that he had to do something to make the enemy move, 
or otherwise his situation would become untenable, so he ordered three quarters of his army to retreat. The experienced Gim knew this was a trap, having already seen this tactic fighting the Jurchen peoples in the north, but inexperienced general Sin Hull was sure that he was about to score a glorious victory and decided to attack. Han Ang In supported him and even ordered the execution of one of the generals who opposed the attack. Gim couldn't let the army advance without him and so had no choice but to join Sin Hull when the latter started crossing the river. Soon the entire Korean army was on the south side of the Imjin River. Showing no signs of resistance, the 5,000 Japanese started fleeing, which only encouraged Sin Hull. Mm -hmm. Both armies entered a Another mountainous area to the south, and immediately after the Koreans were deep enough, Kato gave the order. Muskets sent volley after volley into the pursuers. The battle was over in a matter of minutes. Wow. The Japanese lost almost no troops, while more than 10,000 Koreans were dead with only a portion of the cavalry managing to flee back across the river. Kato was now free to move north, but logistics was still a huge problem for the invading army. With its task of ferrying eight armies now complete, the 700-ship strong Japanese fleet began probing west from Busan along the treacherous Korean south coast. They were moving directly towards Chola, where Yi Sun Shin held command. The Korean Navy as a whole was in a dire state, as most of the vessels of Gyeongsang were burned or scuttled. The commander of the remaining ships, Won Gyun, went into hiding among the many coves and inlets along Korea's southern coast, and sent a letter to Admiral Yi asking for help. But before he acted, Yi started gathering intelligence on Japanese naval movements. Moreover, he hoped to organize a united fleet of 90 ships with other admirals in the area. Some of Yi's men were executed and their heads were displayed to the others in order to improve defeatist moods. Wow. However, on June 12th, the day Seoul fell to Japanese ground forces, Yi was forced to sail. King Seonjo's court issued orders for him to unite his vessels with those of Won Gyun. On June 13th, Yi Sun Shin led his fleet out of Yosu Harbor. It was made up of 39 fighting vessels, 24 large panoxons, 15 smaller deck. The Panoxion was was an oar and sail propelled ship that was the main class of warship used by the Joseon. During the late 16th century, the first ship of this class was constructed in 1555. Ex Sun fighting ships and 46 lighter scout ships known as Sea Ears. Okay. After rendezvousing with Wan at Dangpo, Yi slowly sailed to the east. As his makeshift navy rounded the edge of Koji Island and began working its way north, a scout ship approached them with a message that a fleet of Japanese ships was at anchor in Okpo port. This village was situated inside a large bay, not too far up the coast of Koji Island, and so it was there that the first naval battle of the war would be fought. As Korean naval forces entered the bay, Yi ordered his smaller ships to the flanks, while the heavier warships, including Yi's flagship, formed a line in the center. He sent a message to each of his captains, warning them not to give way, but to stand like mountain castles. Wow. Then he ordered an advance. More than 50 enemy transports were at anchor in front of Okpo village. Most were unmanned, ransacking the village in search of loot and setting fire to houses. Only when Korean ships neared them were they seen by the Japanese, due to the fact that smoke from the burning village obscured their vision. The Japanese hastily rushed back to their ships, attempting to lift anchor and then hugging the coast rather than heading for the open sea. Yi's fleet attacked, engaging the Japanese at a distance and encircling them before opening fire with cannons and fire arrows to the beat of their admiral's war drum. Though Japanese arquebusiers attempted to fire back, the distance meant that Yi's enemies could not attempt boarding actions, and they were gradually destroyed one ship at a time. When this fleet had broken, its crewmen dead or fleeing back to shore, five more ships were spotted in the evening near Hapo, four of which were also destroyed by Yi. Twenty-six ships of the Japanese Navy were destroyed on the first day, without a single loss for Yi Sun Shin's wow. armada. The next morning, 13 additional Japanese ships were spotted near Jinhai. 
Yi once again destroyed 11 out of that number without suffering any losses. During these victories, Admiral Yi was often amused by the exotic trophies taken from enemy ships, particularly their elaborately ornate helmets, which were sent to the king, Xiongzhou, alongside news of the victory. The harrowing experience of civilians Yi encountered after Ok Po further enraged him, providing proof to him of Japan's savagery. The admiral then retreated back to Yosu in order to reorganize his forces. These naval defeats made the Japanese realize that the Korean Navy was not yet defeated, and they sent a force of ships to deal with Yi in early July. Being notified of this expedition to destroy him, the admiral sailed east on July 8th with only 23 warships. He had discarded the smaller Sea-Ear scout ships and replaced them with something altogether more formidable and far more famous, the Kabuksan, otherwise known as the Turtle yep. Ship. The Turtle Ship was 28 meters long, 9 meters wide and 6 meters high, making it a fairly large ship for the time. It sat low in the water, which allowed it to come in under the massive Japanese castle ships and blast their hulls with cannon fire and archery. A sloping roof of planks, bristling with iron spikes, was also laid on top of the hull, encasing the vessel like the shell of a turtle, hence the name. Around 15 of the advanced Korean cannons were mounted on each of these ships, along with a platform of archers. With his ships ready for battle, Admiral Yi sailed for Setyon, where around 50 Japanese ships were anchored, including 12 warships. The Japanese troops were fortified on the cliffs above the bay, where the Japanese commander, Wakazaka Yasaharu, made his command post. Although Yi realized that he could not risk closing with an enemy which possessed such fire support from the land, he also knew the Japanese capacity for arrogance, so he yeah. sent a small force into the bay as bait, and then had it turn and retreat. Yeah, use, use your enemy's arrogance against you. And, uh... As though fleeing in terror. Seeing this apparent display of weakness, Yesaharu's men ran down from the heights and embarked on their ships, pursuing Yi's navy into the middle of the bay. Witnessing the success of his lure, the Korean admiral ordered an assault, with the invincible turtle ships leading the advance. They crashed into the middle of the enemy formation and unleashed a storm of cannon fire and arrows in all directions, causing massive losses among the Japanese vessels. The nimbler Korean vessels were also able to avoid Japanese boarding actions. As his forces neared victory and the enemy ships sank one at a time, Yi was hit by a stray arquebus bullet oh, in the yeah. shoulder but remained stoic. After the enemy fleet had been destroyed, Yi supposedly drew a knife and dug the bullet out with it. When oh. the battle was over, every ship which had pursued him lay burning on the sea or sunk. Victories kept on coming in the days after Sachon. Firstly, at Dangpo, Admiral Yi defeated a 21-ship strong Japanese fleet, once again using his turtle ships to break apart and wreak havoc within the enemy formation. Soon after, the Koreans advanced on a 26-strong anchored enemy armada at Danghang Po. All but one of the Japanese vessels were destroyed after Yi lured them into the open and smashed their battle line to pieces. Wow. The land war was still not going well, but Yi made sure the position of his realm was supreme on the sea. Back in Japan, Hideyoshi was livid at the continued resistance of this small Korean fleet and angrily ordered his admirals, Wakazaki Yasaharu, Kato Yoshiaki, and Kuki Yoshitaka to cease their useless inland plundering and annihilate Yi Sunshin. The advancing armies needed supplies and reinforcements, but the Korean navy was stopping them. At the time, Yasaharu's 82-vessel fleet was the only one ready for the upcoming fight, and the proud daimyo chose to act alone. He would gain the glory from crushing Yi. The following morning, August 15th, Admiral Yi deployed his fleet in a bay near the island of Hansando. Admiral Wan wanted to just attack Yasaharu's fleet, but Yi refused. Rather than meeting Yasaharu's fleet in the narrows of Kyonnerang, where Yi's ships might collide with one another, he sent six Panoksan warships forward as bait for a trap. When these ships emerged into visual range of the enemy, they switched direction and fled. 
Predictably, the victory-hungry yeah. Japanese fleet came barreling in pursuit. As they emerged into the open sea, the Korean fleet spread into a semicircular crane's wing formation, light vessels on the flanks, while the heavier ships formed a sturdy center. When everything was in place, Yi ordered a charge. Immediately, the more nimble wings enveloped all of Yasaharu's vessels, darting in and out whilst showering the enemy with cannon fire and archery. At the same time, the heavier center, fronted by three turtle ships, smashed directly into the enemy formation. Shooting from all sides, the monstrous turtle ships tore many Japanese ships apart with cannon, while the heavy Panoxon warships stayed at a distance, using their advantage in artillery to tear into the Japanese. In particular, metal case firebombs were shot from mortars located on the decks of the Panoxon craft. Okay. It's the first I heard um, of mortars being used. But again, like I said, it's been... I am... I am thoroughly don't know thoroughly the details of the Japanese invasion. Only when the opposing ships were crippled did the Admiral give the order... Oh, go back a bit. Okay, that that'll do it for the for part one of this. Uh, that'll do it. This this is the end of part one for this reaction. So um. So so far, so, uh, such a good video. Sorry, I'm just trying to get off the screen. So um, I will be making a part two of this reaction just to finish off this video. It's only because like um, this video was over an hour long. So, so this is the end of part one. If you like this reaction, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next video.